In this video, I will be discussing a somewhat ignored form, this being the Siciliana. However, like all archaic structural or stylistic forms, the Siciliana has some unique characteristics that have influenced many periods of music, and surprisingly, the Siciliana, while briefly mentioned in music courses, is actually the springboard for a litany of incredibly famous and beloved pieces of music. So before we get into what is now understood as the Siciliana, we must briefly discuss the historical background thereof. There are, however, some difficulties defining a Siciliana the farther back one looks in history, as until the late Baroque period, the term was used more as an adjective to describe types of music with Sicilian influences or origins. The few late medieval sources that mention anything close to what might have been precursors to the Siciliana do so in the context of songs or lyrics of Sicilian origin sung in areas of the Italian peninsula outside of Sicily, such as in Florence or Rome. However, not much is stated as to the structure, mood, or lyrics, so a great deal of information about early Sicilian songs is speculative. It is only known that the lyrics of these songs were most likely of Sicilian origin and highly emotive and moving. It is, however, not known if the music reflected the subject matter of the lyrics in any meaningful way. It is not until the early 17th century that some concrete traits of the Siciliana begin to materialize. During this period, the strambotto was one of the central forms of Italian poetry. The poems were constructed with eight 11-syllable lines with rhyme schemes that varied depending on the region of Italy, of which there was a Sicilian version that was popular in southern Italy. So songs that used poems with the rhyme scheme of the Sicilian strambotto were titled Aria Siciliana irrespective of whether the poem was written in Sicily. One of the earliest examples of an aria siciliana is the Amore Celato, found in the 1618 collection of songs by Giovanni Stefani, titled Affetti Amorosi. Si ben mostru di fora tutto ielu Ardi lo petto mio di fuoco tali, chi come un monci bello dentro cielo, l'audentissima chiama a nulla e quali. While the traits inherent to a Siciliana would eventually change with time, a few important precursors to the Siciliana as it later would be defined appear in this piece, such as the oscillation of the singer up and down an interval of the second in a recitative or spoken word-like fashion, and the inclusion of an almost proto-Neapolitan sixth with the lowered second degree in measure eight. Another important aspect to consider is that the poems used as the basis for these songs were melancholy in nature. The trope of Sicilianas being melancholy and plaintive is something that remains to this very day. Another aspect inherent to Sicilianas going forward is their proximity to guitar literature, as it was often a guitar used to accompany singers in southern Italy. Due to this, Sicilianas were commonly understood and utilized by guitarists across Europe from the 17th century onwards. It is only at the dawn of the 18th century in the late Baroque that the traits of the modern Siciliana begin to finally materialize. While throughout the 17th century, the Siciliana is mentioned sporadically in a few sources as also being a dance called La Siciliana, the evidence for this dance being widespread and popular like the Courant or Minuet is sparse, and existed probably only as a choreography to accompany a Sicilian song, which varied significantly from region to region in Europe, thus not reflecting a folk tradition of purely Sicilian origin. In fact, by the early 18th century, music dictionaries and lexicons seem to agree that the Siciliana, or Canzonetta Siciliana as they contemporaneously called it, was only associated with secular vocal music as opposed to dance. These sources also give some of the first formulaic hints as to what defines a Canzonetta Siciliana, these being that it is somewhat like a gig in 12 eighth or 6 eighth time and written in a rondo form with a da capo. This differs from the strambotto based aria Siciliana written 
a hundred years earlier, which were often in a four-half or four-quarter time. So it could be the case that many of the main characteristics of the Canzonetta Siciliana arose out of the Neapolitan school of music, of which Sicilian-born composer Alessandro Scarlatti was one of the most important representatives, a composer who often employed 12 eighth time in the arias of his operas, and also Neapolitan sixths, both characteristics that would become common in the Sicilianas of the late Baroque. Besides the use of the 12 eighth or 6 eighth time signature, the Siciliana of the late Baroque makes use of aspects of these rhythmic phrases in a moderate to slow tempo. It is for this reason that the Siciliana is sometimes called the slow chic, but I find this too simplistic an explanation to be honest. Another trait the Siciliana of the late Baroque takes on is the characteristic of being melancholic, something seen as far back as the 17th century Sicilian Strambotto-based songs. One of the first true examples of a Siciliana that embodies most of the standard traits of what we now define as a Siciliana is the final aria from Handel's solo cantata, Armida Abbandonata. Besides being lamenting and melancholy in its mood, it also displays the slow tempo, 12 eighth time signature, and even a Neapolitan sixth, which is why this aria is considered by many to be the first true Siciliana, ironically written by a composer who did not come from Italy. Unfortunately, it is still somewhat of a mystery as to where and how all of these traits came together to become what we now define as a Siciliana, as not one singular folk tradition can be pointed to in Sicily that resembles the Siciliana. Rather, it seems the Siciliana is more a set of characteristics that were representative of musical traits unique to southern Italian songs, which took much of their stylistic traits from how Sicilians and Neapolitans speak and ultimately sang, and how in turn those secular and folk music characteristics were adopted into high art, such as in the operas of Scarlatti. One might postulate that Handel's Siciliana from Armida Abandonata was merely the iteration that became the most influential, as Handel also wrote Sicilianas which weren't necessarily slow or even melancholy. However, towards the very end of the Baroque period, the slow, plaintive, peaceful, melancholy, and minor key Siciliana established itself slowly but surely throughout Europe, and perhaps one of the best examples of this stylistic standardization is Bach's Siciliano from his flute sonata in E-flat. It is traits found in this Siciliana that find their way into a great deal of Sicilianas written thereafter. One trait I'd like to highlight in Bach's Siciliana, or Siciliano as he called it, is the contour of the melody, in particular the changing note up and down a second on the dotted eighth figure. This will become an almost standard hallmark going forward, as what happens next in the story of the Siciliana is actually quite astounding, as I would wager a bet that most of you watching this video don't realize just how many iterations of the Siciliana you already know incredibly well. By the classical period, the traits of the Siciliana began to be used in other works not written in a rondo or da capo form, or even titled Sicilianas and are generally found in the slow lamenting arias and instrumental slow movements of the era. I will now play a montage of selected classical period Sicilianas, some of which will be very familiar. Keep in mind these pieces have fairly different structural forms. The Siciliana of the classical period mostly manifests itself as a stylistic mold that composers added on top of a structural form like ternary or theme and variations form. Therefore, the characteristics of the Siciliana set the mood, tempo, and time signature, but not the structure of the piece.
This montage could keep going, but I think you get the idea. However, before I move on, I would like to mention perhaps the most famous Siciliana of all. In 1818, on Christmas Eve in the small town of Oberndorf, near Salzburg in Austria, the priest of the town parish asked a town schoolmaster and organist, Franz Xaver Gruber, to set a text the priest had written two years prior to music. As the parish's organ had been damaged due to flooding, the priest requested that the melody be accompanied by a guitar. The resulting song was to be performed at that night's Christmas Mass. This song was Stille Nacht, or as it is known in English, Silent Night. Perhaps the most famous and, in my opinion, most beautiful of all the Christmas carols, and just another example of a piece of music that makes use of the hallmarks attributed to the Siciliana. Throughout the Romantic period and even into the 20th century, the Siciliana would occasionally be used by composers such as in Brahms' variations on a theme by Haydn or Respighi's third suite of his ancient airs and dances, or Mascagni's opera Cavalleria Rusticana. However, one Siciliana of note from the late 19th century is found in Gabriel Fauré's incidental music to the play Pelias et Mélissante, which he later reworked into an orchestral suite. Some of you might have noticed that this piece actually sounds fairly similar to another piece of music that is firmly ingrained into modern pop culture, this being Hedwig's theme from John Williams' score to Harry Potter, but most just refer to this cue now as the Harry Potter theme. Although the cue by Williams is notated in 3 8 time, it is still clearly a spiritual relative of the Siciliana. It is also entirely possible Williams chose 3 8 time simply to keep the music legible due to the lightning quick accompanying scales. So there you have it. That is the Siciliana. But to be honest, the reason I spent so much time outlining a stylistic form that generally gets no more than a few sentences devoted to it in music literature is that the Siciliana is used far too often and throughout far too many periods of music to be pushed aside as some inconsequential obscurity of music history. From some of the most beautiful arias and instrumental music of the Baroque and Classical period to Silent Night and finally one of the most beloved of all of John Williams' themes, the Siciliana offers a unique foundation for composers to build off of. One of the reasons I make these form videos is to help the viewer realize it isn't just merely an unseen muse that supplies a composer with melodies from some sort of mystical ether. When Mozart sat down to write some of his most sublime slow movements and arias, his knowledge of the Siciliana would have already given him some key starting points to work with. After that, of course, comes the divine spark and Mozart's genius and command of many other realms of music. But something as seemingly insignificant as the Siciliana can actually explain far more works than one might suspect. However, the cultivation of these topics in music academia is increasingly becoming substandard at best. This is of great detriment to young composers, conductors, and musicians who have too many gaps in what they know about classical music and how certain forms and styles developed, which is why I hope this video will be of some use filling in those gaps. Mm -hmm.